Hello guys and welcome to The Last Word, a show where we get a bunch of fools and then panelists and people and we talk Dota, we talk Dota teams, and we talk about the teams that are going to go to the Lima Major. Now we're talking about everyone's favorite region, North America, also known as Near Airport Region. We have Winter, we have Adam, and we have Seek and Strike to talk about this. Guys, I think undoubtedly NA is, is considered the weakest region overall, but are the top two teams in NA which are going to the Major that week? Winter. I feel like uh, TSM is a, a very good team, you know. Uh, even though a lot of their opponents are uh, garbage or whatever <laughs> you want to put it, you know. <laughs> I didn't However you want to put it. <laughs> Nobody prompted you to say that. Holy no punches. Yeah, but I feel like they have a very uh, good way of uh, drafting and playing around as a team. And it's been showing in, in the region despite having weaker opponents. But I, I tend to focus on not just the opponents, but the way they are functioning as a team. And I feel like they have what it takes to do well in Peru. Can we continue with Adam? You were talking about, he just said the region is garbage. You said, do you talk about TSM? I feel like TSM is, they look like a hungry, young, young player kind of team. You know, it's really refreshing to watch. I think Moon has really nice drafts. I think he's the one drafting for him. He's their coach. Yes. And uh, I I have like pretty high expectations of them actually. I think they are, this is the year where they take over NA. Shopify Rebellion to me has been a bit underwhelming. I think they're very, They've been very stagnant. I think all this while they've been like consistent top three team, right? Like EG, you know, the memes. But I feel like over the past year, they had a really rough year with Nightfall as their offlane. Now they have Saberlight, which is, I think more of a fit for the team, but they're still trying to figure things out. And yeah, uh, I think- They can't figure things out. They're really expired as a team. Okay, Richie. Wow. Richie, let, let, we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, Richie. Okay, so. Um, the shop Rider villain, I mean, I, I think they, we talked about this in the C episode, uh, Adam, you brought it up as well, but like when you're at the top, you don't learn anything, right? And their opportunities to learn have been slim to none. Uh, when they were part of EG, they were not scrimming. They would, they would, I think they would barely scrim. I think, uh, in the second year of DPC as EG, they did do some scrims with, um, like internationally with Western European, European teams. European teams. Yes, they of course. They didn't scrim in teams. But they also would never do any other officials in third party tournaments in NA, right? And then you naturally have to ask the question, where are you learning then, right? I guess in scrims, but that's limited. I don't know what their scrim schedule was like, of course, but it seemed like it was spread out over the course of six weeks because that DPC season, of course, was highly criticized by players. And it didn't seem like there was a lot of drive to learn. They would show up to LAN, Stockholm. They obviously completely crashed out of that one. Uh, and then they had a pretty good showing at TI and then bombed out immediately on the main stage, right? Despite the RTZ bald buff. I mean, it's just a team that never gets opportunities to learn. And by the time they start learning, it's way too late, right? Like you're saying, I, I think you, you spend nine months out of the year coasting, right? And then for two weeks, you're on the struggle bus. Like you don't know what you're doing there. I, I think this is a team that has been constantly on top because they have, I mean, they have really strong players. No one's doubting it. Fly, Saberlight, Arteezy, of course, right? Crit. And then all of a sudden you, you show up and things get difficult for you. And I think it's a lot. I think it's a lot for them to deal with. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned for them yet again. I'm hopeful with the new addition of Saberlight. I think that's really reinvigorated this team. Um, but you know, this is gonna be a really big test for them. I think they're one of the biggest storylines heading in new org, slightly new reworked roster. Like I'm excited. I'm excited to see how they do for sure. Okay. Let's touch on the expired comment now, rather we've had a reasonable comment. Uh, I actually had that as one of my questions, not with those words, but I did because I was looking at stats for teams that have stayed together for that core for that long. Uh, in this case, you'd have the RTZ plus Crit core or RTZ Crit Abed, right? Specifically, I've stayed together for a while. Fly has now been in the team for like two years, almost two, three years, actually. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, or not. But, you know, he's been on the team for a while. Uh, other teams that have done that uh, have not found success. Uh, other examples like Beast Coast, for example, though they found success being top six, which is pretty impressive at TI. That was as far as they got. Um, or top eight, sorry. Uh, with, in the case of Alliance, which was the Insania Alliance, if you guys remember, that team also did not find success. And all these teams, what they do share in common is that once they broke off, they found better success. Beast Coast is now top of the DPC, which they never managed to do together. Uh, Alliance is a team that now with Insania and Liquid, and actually their players kind of spread out, also found a lot of success. Not the org, the org is in Div 2, but no, the players themselves. Do you feel like EG needs that, or is it even possible for them to achieve that? You mean Shopify? Sorry. Shopify, Shopify Rebellion. Yes, I forgot they changed the name. Yes, do you think Shopify needs that? They need to do more shopping for other players. Oh, so you don't even trust the players individually anymore? They have to go their own ways, I feel like. They're, they're together for too long. It's like they, they're comfortable, too comfortable with each other. So they keep 
it's that X you keep going back to, you know, you, then you just ruin your future. You don't want to go anywhere else and you're stuck there, you're stagnant. I feel like they have a lot of ideas where they have been running the same ideas, you know, over and over and over and over and over and over. And, over. and it's like madness, you know, you do the same thing over and over again, but you expect the same result, you know. Something is wrong with the team. And I feel like they are, you say that they don't have opportunities, you know, in screams and I feel like I disagree, you know. I feel like if they, their motivation is correct, they would have gone to another region. The players would have gone to an, uh, other regions and find better opportunities. Uh, I feel like they're just there because it's like a free ticket. It feels like it feels like that to me. It's a free ticket to whatever major TI, whatever you want to call it. And they're just happy maybe with uh, with their salary and they're not really dreaming of a, a bigger thing, you know. Though I will comment on, on that as Winter's opinion, Winter's alone. Uh, I will point Add out Dota. <laughs> to Dota. I will point out that the opportunities thing is indeed a lie. Uh the teams that for example are now in Brazil with a new VPN, the South American teams are now going there, EG and the Beast Coast. Beast Coast had the plan, then ESP did some things to them, but their their plan was to go to Brazil because they could scrim European teams and their ping was eighty. Eighty wow. to sixty. In, in US East, you can scrim with a similar ping as well. Uh, no, Nouns, for example, we know they scrim European teams that allow them to regularly as well. So this idea that NA has said that they don't have scrim partners is unless you live in the West Coast. Do the Euro teams want to scrim you? Yes. I mean, when, when I played there... I mean, in the, ca in the case of, uh, of South American teams, for example, top two, certainly. Yeah, I can see that. But when I played there, SA teams, I would say more than half of the scrims, they don't show up. Well, I say right, too. Right, right, that's why Ma Matthew did need to uh, pull a couple of strings and be like, hey guys, I'm not actually South American and they believed him. Uh, <laughs> but in the case of Shopify Rebellion or the case of, uh, sorry, TSM, I don't think that stands true. Like, those teams definitely can get scrims with top yeah, teams. So, it is all like back end stuff that we really aren't very clear about. I think, like, Dota wise, I feel like the team as a whole, they like the, they don't have flair. They're like consistent, like all their players are consistent. Fire is out, it's like getting married, you know, the fire is already out. Winter is married. They're <laughs> 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 I mean, I feel like, I feel like RTZ, I'll bet these players, they're like so high skill, so high skill even today. But the way they play Oda, it's like so high percentage, they always make high percentage choices. There's no like surprise factor, there's no wow factor, like it just always looks like that, you know. Yeah, I think my point on, on not being able to learn wasn't so much about being able to find scrim opponents. I do believe you can learn from scrims, but if you just don't practice it, like, it, or if you don't put that practice into into your officials, I don't know how much of that sticks for them. Because I think like the NA meta, especially for them, because they are of such a high caliber, they can almost probably pick anything, you know? Like let's, I mean, you know, the skill gap is pretty big in it. It has been since the, since, since the inception of DPC, right? The difference, usually there's been three really strong teams in NA. This time it's really only been two. It looked like Nouns was maybe making a play there for a while, but unfortunately it didn't work out for them. Um, but I'm pretty sure like almost every single season before the, this year, we've always had uh, three teams tied at 6-1, right? And they've always almost always gone to tiebreaker. Didn't even happen this year. So I, I agree, like they can always scrim more. They can scrim SA, they can scrim, they can scrim Western Europe. But we already see this, like even in C, each region kind of has its own meta. Sure, obviously you have the big heroes, like the Lina's are going to be everywhere, right? But if you try and run something in your scrims and then you don't need to apply that into your officials or if you don't pub with it because it's what I, like, I just don't know how much of it sticks, man. That's what I mean, especially when they don't do any third parties. Like, that's my concern with this team. And I love Arteezy. I'm the biggest Arteezy fan. He is, he is, he is American, so he has to he, be. Uh, but I, I, I like that point because NA, interesting stat, is the only region to ever do, to ever have a scoreline for DPC in Div 2 previously and now in Div 1 that has a perfect scoreline. As right. Where the first team is 7-0, second team is 6-1, 5-2. No other region has had that scoreline, only NA. And, and that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from on that, right? I, I just feel like they're not, they haven't really ever been super highly challenged in their region. They've never missed a major, we'll say, right? As EG, as Shopify Rebellion, they, they continue that, which is great on individual merit however like we're saying if you're always at the top and you know you're only getting gunned down at these international events these things only roll by every once every three months you know and how quickly can you learn right that that's what we were praising c about they learn fast how quickly do you learn when you're not challenging your region in your own pubs when you're only challenging scrims which who knows how often they take place but you don't get to apply any of that practice in officials 
until the, the majors or TIs come up. I, I don't know. That's my concern with these guys. You know, I'm sure the players know that, you know, that's why I question the motivation. Because well, TSM what? does have motivation yeah. in that sense. Yeah, right? TSM has motivation, but I feel like uh, SR doesn't really have much motivation. I don't see, maybe they have, but I just don't see it translated into the team, the game, you know, you just don't feel the vibe there, you know. I would like to ask about, uh, you touched on an important topic, uh, pubs. How much do pubs affect the level of the region? Because uh, NA, I think we can all agree, has the worst pubs. No offense to any players. They can just play you, right? What? Can play they just play they, they mostly play ADU. Yeah. But then how do you even develop a meta for the region? Are you just not copying I EU? mean, the region, the truth is that not many people play Dota in NA. And as a pro player, you, you have to make the better choice, which is to play the better pubs, sad to say. But it is what it is, you know. You can't like sacrifice your your own improvement, your own growth for the region. Like one player playing there, like ATZ playing in NA is not gonna change a lot of things for them, you know? Which leads to the second point that I want to bring up here, which is uh, the whole idea of playing in NA. Tai Boy had previously called out, even though he got to absolutely destroy the Moon Leander, but uh, before he got destroyed, he called out a couple of the top teams, particularly Shopify Rebellion, uh, old DG, for not scrimming with teams of the region whatsoever. So when you have these two teams that go, TSM does do that. They've already stated and they scrum down, for example, and a couple of the other teams, so that's fine. But when you have two teams that go and these team, two teams don't scrim with the region, is there even a chance for your region to get better? Isn't the whole point of the major slot system? I mean, it grows bad habits, right? If you scrim like teams that are too big of a gap. Oh, you think like, so? Yeah, it does for sure. I think it's very natural for people to be a bit lazier because they feel the game is pointless. I guess so, yeah. Like, what, what do you really learn, you know? It's like practice, you you type on a keyboard every day and then you go there and you type yeah, again. I'm sure you like, know this, right? If you you play a pub, you are like 5k MMR, you play with a 3k MMR pub. Or four, even 4k MMR, you feel like the games are so big difference here. That's the same thing here. Like why, you can't really blame them for not wanting to scream the weaker team you know? The gap is just very big. If you're TSM and TSM screams, for uh, example, TSM only screams the top Europe teams. And meanwhile, you are SR and you go scrim NA teams. I think at the end of the season, it's actually like, the opposite. But like, <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, opposite. But yeah, it's. I I guess mentality is mentality matters a lot too. Like I would think it's a player decision as well to not scrim. But I think coming in, it depends what your goal is. I think like I think Blitz mentioned that they scrim differently now. They like have goals. Like win or lose doesn't really matter. They have goals what they want to accomplish in scrims. I think this kind of system, like, it doesn't really matter who you play. Of course, there's like a difficulty level, right? You don't always want to be playing the worst teams. Sometimes you want to play better teams, but there definitely can be a balance depending on how much you play. Yeah, I think that's true. And I actually think, I mean, who knows? I, I don't even know how scrims go, but I think that's true. I mean, scrims are practice, right? When you when you practice for a traditional sport, you're not always necessarily playing to win versus the practice squad. You know, you're practicing things. I think that's that's a better way of looking at it. But of course, like if you're practicing against opponents of a much weaker caliber, like how good of a practice is it, right? Like I don't know, I don't know. I, I guess that's that's certainly one thing. Uh, back to the topic at hand, you know, because I see what you're saying. It seems like there's like usually three, sometimes maybe this season we'll see for the future tours two teams that are just seemingly above everyone else. How do the bottom six teams advance, right? I guess that's that's kind of the problem with NA. I mean, we did a lot of NA Div two last year, right? And uh, especially in Div 2, some of those teams were just five strong players that just played together, right? And there wasn't really much more of a goal other than that, or it was even uni students like Fixers from SEA who were just play with their friends in Div 2 because they were having fun, you know? Like, And there's not a lot of motivation there to scrim, so I, I feel like it is kind of a little bit more of a cultural issue in, in as far as North American Dota goes, because it's like... It's, you need building blocks to get there, right? To get to that the top level, right? Because you need the bottom six teams to all scrim and individually improve to get to the level of the top two. But for that to happen, the bottom eight teams need to all scrim each other and build up to that level so that, you know what I mean? As soon as you have like one rung on that ladder missing, I feel like it all kind of falls apart. I do want to point out on the idea of scrimming weaker teams, which I think was interesting when I looked at interviews from other teams. Uh, in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, 
they scrim Div 2 teams all the time. Like, it's very common. Uh, Puck Champ was, for example, a very well-known team because they always appear on scrims on time. They apparently can play, like, 30 scrims a day, and they don't care. And they scrimmed everyone. In the majors, for example, they were a very common scrim partner. Uh, in South America, I know for a fact that Evil Genius... Beast Ghost just doesn't... They hate scrims. But Evil Geniuses specifically scrims a lot of Div 2 teams, even teams that went through open qualifiers sometimes for practice purposes. The only region I've heard that does this whole elitist student thing is specifically in it. Where they say that, like, oh, these, like, teams are not good enough. But other regions don't seem to care as much. So maybe it's also mentality. And I say NA, and I mean Shopify Rebellion. <laughs> or EG. Because uh, uh, TSM has specifically said that I that's mean, the case. it could also be because their schedule is shorter. Like, you know that you players still love them, they... You know your boot camping, they play differently. I think also... Oh, honestly, they don't live like, there, actually. That's a good point. They don't live there all the whole year. Uh, and also, like... EU Div 2 is pretty competitive, like I wouldn't say the teams are very weak. Like sure, the Div 1 teams are better, but it's not like a huge, huge gap, I think. Oh, you think there's a bigger gap between NA Div 1 teams and... Like, do you think the top NA Div 1 team to like, say, the 4th team? I think team? the NA, maybe not 4th, maybe like 6th, 7th. Really? I, I think it's big. Yeah, maybe 4th is like... I mean, below Nouns, who's below Nouns? I'm not 100% sure. Is it Wildcard, I think so. It's probably Wildcard, yeah. And I would say, I would say Wildcard is a pretty decent gap. I agree. I, like, that's what I was saying. Like, it, it does feel like there's a couple of rungs missing on this ladder for there to be, like, a smooth ramp up. It feels like, you know, bottom, we'll call it, what, bottom uh, 12, bottom 12 to 16 in NA Div 2 are usually some of these stacks. So we're talking the, the bottom four teams in Div 2 are usually just, like, stacks that play together. It was wildcard, by the way. I, I feel like if you're, okay, like, if I'm EG's major and I want to find scrims, I'm not going to look at NA, I'm not going to look at you. I'm going to put them all in a pool and there'll be a ranking of like who I want to scrim. Right. And so you say Waka is fourth in NA, yes, or Nouns is third, but when you mix in the Europe teams to what what rank are they on the list, you know? Sure. It could be number eight or nine. So you go through like seven teams before you get to them, which I think is a very logical of like choice of scrim partners. It's a good point. I see what you're saying. And now as we, uh, the final topic with is the, the future of NA, I'm going to talk to my resident North American here. Uh, I was looking at Div 2 actually before doing this. I mean, Div 1 is actually similar, but Div 2, uh, there's more not North Americans in NA than yes. North Americans. And Div 2 almost has more Peruvians in, than in North Americans, straight up, which is just a single country. They're not living in North America <laughs> either, by the way. Right, it's the two players that can be outside of the region. For there's, each there's teams that are full on five Peruvians, and some of them are just going there during the time because they're. Oh, more, okay. Yeah, kind of that stuff, yeah. Uh, so. What does the future look like for, for North America if that's the case? Because at least when we were casting it, there was a fair amount of North American teams. Uh, that number seems to have dropped, and now it's it really does seem like a, a tourist region. Yeah, How do I you mean, improve on that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a really good question. I, I think for me, like, there is a world where NA can kind of still be this uh, competitive scene while still having, quote-unquote, the tourist teams in. Um, if there is, like, brand support, you know? Like if there is like, I, I mean, it's it's, it's kind of sad to say, obviously, because EG's just left the region, right? And people are investing and doing this specifically with SA. But if we saw this same similar effect with NA, um, I think this would be kind of a celebrated thing, right? It's only because it's just kind of individual players making that move why it's kind of a bad thing, right? And unfortunately, I think it just comes down to economics. NA is simply just a more expensive region. Cost means like five times at least what it is in SA, yeah, it's right? Ridiculous. So it's like when when you're a brand and you're trying to invest in another region and do all your brand things and whatever, right? And support uh, the Dota scene there locally. It's a, it's hard to really go into NA when you could go into SA, Eastern Europe, or even C for half the cost. I will also point out cost. that NA's struggle is not exclusive to Dota. NA struggles in almost every esport. It's true. Yeah. That they don't play exclusively, like fighting games, for example, yep. Yep. Uh, where it's almost an NA sport. I mean, Overwatch League, I'm pretty sure there was like the Dallas, I, I watched the, the finals. It was like the Dallas something versus another import, Seattle team. And they're all Korean. Yeah, know? that's Mavericks. Yeah, no, no, not the Mavericks. that's a basketball but, team, sir. But the Mavericks do own them, actually, funny enough. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it, and, you know, and for Overwatch League, although we'll, we'll see how that does because I've been hearing things about their next season, right? For, for I mean, who cares, right? I mean, but that's... CS, League of Legends, yeah, also. Yeah, and, and, like, that stuff works in Valorant. Like, that stuff can work if the scene supports it, right? It just doesn't seem like that's the case right now for, for NA. It's so odd to me because I feel NA has, like, the biggest stream viewership. Like, not in terms of, like, tournaments, but, like, the Valorant players, the Dota players, when they stream, boom, you know, so many viewers. I feel like so many people watch esports, but no one actually plays, like tries and chase. I mean, it's not worth it to play in the other. 
I, I guess mean, so, yeah. I'm with you, dude. North America, or specifically the United States, is such a massive brand powerhouse. Like, you literally go to brands and they go, and just that country alone is like China. It's actually so massive and there's so much consumerism in that country that I am very surprised that brands don't want to invest in exclusively North American viewers. They're English speakers, they're mostly affluent, especially the ones that watch Dota. Uh, they have a humongous amount of people, even if viewership is going down. It's just a return for your investment, right? Like you said, it's like five times more expensive. So is the return worth it? Yeah. You know, compared Especially, to, yeah, you get choices like internationally, right? Like you said, you throw a quarter of the money in SCA, you probably get the same thing back. Yeah, especially if it's uh, like your first foray into there. Like we're looking at big NA brands like 100 Thieves, Cloud9 has been in and out of Dota for and a time. Those guys make content and those guys, like when 100 Thieves makes content, I mean, compared I, to Beast Girls, for example. I, I agree, but it's expensive, right? Yeah, that's true. And you could spend still, like I'm saying, a third of the price to do that for an SA team just on operational costs. I mean, now I'm purchasing this from a producer's perspective, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just when you show this to the decision makers at the top, it just doesn't make sense in NA. I think you sponsor a TC stream and you make what you oh, gave them in like a that's day. That's true. You don't even need to give them a microphone or a webcam. No, literally. It's amazing. You don't yeah. even tell me he's streaming. Just... Keyboard, mouse, don't have to. Yeah. You have a camera behind him. Yeah, and it's camera. filming the screen. Yeah, exactly. I think you would just make it back because I think you're right. We're also getting off this panel because then talk is done. Three, two, one. Get a lot of damage, but here comes the black hole. Get